Hi. Good morning. I think it's really quite familiar to sitting in a cinema kind of environment, giving that kind of introduction. But um, I also think, I hope it's, it's an easy start, right? When I spoke to the conference organizers, they're like, oh, could you put something together that kind of like touches on all the various different topics that you heard about yesterday and today? And I was like, sure. And then I realized, whoa, there's a lot of amazing stuff that was talked about. So let's figure out how I can bring that in with my kind of career. I really wish they would have given you some popcorn. But um, so I just want to start off with just giving a bit of context of myself, right? And I think it's we all, when we come to work, have a different frame of reference. And I think that depends on kind of like the experiences that we all have through work, through cultures, through our upbringing, right? So I want to share a bit about myself and where some of the thoughts that I have and some of the key learnings that I've been taking throughout my career kind of like come from. Maybe I should have called this kind of like my reflective learning journey, but that's the one for next year. So um, I grew up in Germany. Um, I spent most of my university at the, in the UK. So I did a BSc in computer science. I did a master's in computer animation, actually in the same town that your parents are from, from our next biggest small world, right? Um, a bit more on animation later, but what really got me to it was just this idea I can use bro programming to blow stuff up, which is just amazing. Um, I think on a more serious note, though, that I believe these studies um, to this day gave you the craft kind of my core skills that I think are essential for me to work in the technical environment where I spent most of my career. So I actually started as a paramedic. Um, and I think to this day, this is giving me a really serious appreciation around resilience, right? I think our work does get stressful. It's really hard at times. But I always remind myself at the end, no one is going to die. Now, I appreciate that's really dark, but it really, I think, puts things into perspective. I then started to work as a software engineer for Sun Microsystems in Silicon Valley, and this is actually now the Facebook campus. So you can see how things kind of change. Sun was 45,000 people when I worked for them. Um, apparently, they had this thing that they had to produce a T-shirt for every single thing that they released. So they were the largest T-shirt producer in California. Right? So again, putting things in perspective. So I worked on an exploratory area that was called knowledge management. Um, so it was how, how do we produce and consume information? It was a major challenge just given the sheer scale that they were working in. And I think that gave me a massive appreciation of the importance of the organizational knowledge. I think the organizational knowledge in this room is just phenomenal. But how do you make that available, discoverable for everybody else in the organization is, is critical. Now, building websites and databases really wasn't my forte. It's kind of now again. But um, so I decided to come back to the UK, do the master, and then I spent over a decade in visual effects. So MPC was a story of just absolute growth, right? Across people, across locations, just the scale of the operations. Um, there was a time when I looked at all my metrics and they were all on exponential graphs, right? In terms of the amount of releases, data, storage, networking, it is really phenomenal to work in an environment like that. Quite stressful. Um, so just to give you an idea, when I started, we had one office in Soho. We um, worked about two projects at a given time and around 250 people. By the time I left, we were 3,500 people across 10 different offices from India to America into Europe um, and working about 20 projects at a given time. And it made MPC the biggest, one of the biggest um, studios in the world. I started as a developer on destruction tools. Yeah, my passion to blow stuff up, like this volcano, for example. Um, and I ended up heading up what was called the global core engineering team. So we were responsible for the 24-7 operations of all of the production processes. So you, you just never know where a career might take you. Um, my time there really showed me the importance of standards, right? So how critical it is that you've got your standards, your central production process, but really clear integration patterns for how do you adapt new technology. I mean, I think sometimes we call this kind of computational governance. I really should have coined that phrase back then because it was all about how do I make my data available? How do I understand the quality? How do I change it? And the same applies to APIs. Um, there was also a time we, we spent a lot of kind of like really on exploratory code and how do I take that code into production? And the key learnings there it was, was always a transition, right? You always transfer people and code, never just code. I have never seen that work, but that was, was really kind of critical. Um, and also just how do you understand the true cost of things? And that's where you need to include your HR and your finance processes. So started about five years ago at the BBC in a department called Very Long Technology, Strategy and Architecture. I think I had the longest job title at the BBC, um, which was really created as in to focus on industry trends, focus on BBC R&D and how those things kind of apply to our production process. A great venture into voice and AI, although it kind of didn't go that far. 
Um, I then moved to BBC R&D as an architect and to really provide the technical direction for a research project. Um, I was investigating kind of like what are new services that the BBC should investigate around kind of like data capabilities. Um, and this was a specific focus around personal data stores. I'm really curious, has anyone heard about Tim Berners-Lee's solid project? Yes! <laughs> amazing. One, we're on a mission. Yes, but it was, it's amazing. So, so Tim is really kind of wants to change the way that personal data, all of our data, is used within the internet. And it's really changing the way in which you are in control about how your data is processed and integrated. Now, it was really one of those, those moments where I went, I just fully believe in that kind of technology. However, you've got to be careful of how that fits within your kind of like organization. So sometimes it will take time, but we're going to watch this space, right? Yes. Good. One. Yay. Um, so now I head up the architecture, as mentioned for kind of like I refer to it as a third of the digital um, estate. So when you log in to us, when you write us a comment or voting, when you see all our contents on the kind of iPlayer news, there's all the systems that kind of I drive the, the technical strategy with my team. And but so what does that mean for us as kind of like individual contributors? And I think we're perfectly placed to really evolve the tech, the processes and operating models within any organization. Um, I should say that I tend to use architect and individual contributors interchangeably through this um, presentation. So just stick with me, please. Uh, so for me, an architect works at the intersection between many, many different disciplines, right? But I think in particular that kind of like product engineering and delivery aspect. So, and that kind of like comes back to the, the, the core craft that I mentioned, kind of like my, my computer science skills. So right, I can go into a room, speak with engineering about the implementation details. How do we need to evolve it? I can work with products, data, strategy, UX to really go, what are the business and user needs and how do we drive and evolve our systems forward? And I also think because as an architect, you tend to understand how all of these systems interact. You can then actually use that information to drive the best path um, for delivery. The other questions I tend to get asked a lot is like, right in your work, kind of like more senior you get, what's, what is that split between working with people and working with tech? And for me, it's this, right? It's literally 90% people and 10% tech. So I just want to spend a bit of time to really share just what I think is critical as an individual contributor to work on I think, influencing, and then also creating rapport. Now I do use the word rapport quite specifically because its definition is a relationship, especially one of mutual trust or emotional affinity, because I think that is really important for how do we engage with our colleagues. So what's been critical for me to gain those skills? Now I've been very, very lucky to have been coached by a couple of really excellent coaches, and that has given me an ongoing interest to really understand myself. So what are my values? What are my principles? But then also, what are my drivers? What are my triggers? Like what emotions get raised? What actions do I do based on those? And then what in fact or effect has us that have on others? And I actually apply this in and outside of the workplace. So for example, my drivers are to be perfect and um, to please people, which is a horrendous combination, right? Because I tend to say yes to everything. I said yes to give this talk, right? And then I want it to be perfect. So I spend ages working on it. Now, I do then also have to learn how to say no. That's really important for me. And something I continuously have to improve. On the other hand, I know it's really difficult when I approach or work with someone who has her hurry up driver, because that has a tendency for me to go and say, well, hold on, we haven't considered this, this, and this, and this, and this. So you just, it really helps you trying to find the balance. It's been one of the big changes for me because it's allowed me to grow through really difficult situations because in those, that's when really our drivers and triggers do get triggered. Um, but also I find that teams that spend time investigating in this are the most kind of like high performance. So to the point that I'm actually currently, no, actually I got um, approved yesterday to be a coach within the BBC, which I find really exciting. Um, so talking about personal development, I've really always been curious and really figuring out how do you enable yourself to continuously learn. So at Sun, that was quite regimented. We had to have a number of hours per month actually spent on training. But it really showed me the importance to continuously learn and also what a privilege it actually is. My time at MPC has really shown me that things never stay still, right? Literally never. There were moments where we had to move from, I just said, the, the Watchmen example, right? Yay, we're going to get Watchmen, but you know what? We have to produce it in Vancouver. I'm like, well, hold on a minute. We, how do you build the multi-site pipelines? In three months. Okay, great. So you go, right? And then there's multiple different new technology coming about. So it's, it's critical to always 
stay on top of what those trends are. But talking about trends, the other thing is, is really key. It's like, how do you actually make decisions, right? And that's one element that I think really changed some aspects in, in kind of like, how do I look at what, what do we need to decide every day? So I had the opportunity to join a training course around strategic decision making, which was really interesting. And I was just, just actually a couple of days reading an interview with Jeff Bezos, where he said that the more senior you get, the one responsibility you have is take one or two high quality decisions a day. So, all right, that would be lovely to just do that for a day. I said, Amazing. Um, so this course really investigated the behavioral kind of like decision science behind how we as humans kind of like make decisions, right? And how do we evaluate that? And from on kind of like, it was really focusing, how do we improve the process, right? Not kind of like give you frameworks and, and, and aspects, but I kind of ask yourself, what was the last big decision that you had to make, right? How many options did you actually consider? So the research they showed is that the majority only take one option. And with those one options in the research they did, 80% was a common failure rate. The minute you introduce that to maybe potentially three options, the failure rate of the final decision goes down to 20%, right? So I think there is something really quite significant within this. So let me show you the three steps that was um, important here. First, look at the judgments, the assumptions, and the biases that, you all, that we all make. I make them on a daily basis when we come into making a decision. Is this, well, hold on a minute. That never worked in the past is one I commonly hear, right? Okay, but why is that? There's things like, um, do we have all the data? Are we making this decision? Because we actually just want it to confirm an output that we already want to achieve, right? So if you really distill these things down, you're then actually, actually trying to understand what are the true objectives. And it's not just one, it's multiple, right? It could be the simple ones of, well, we want to decrease costs and increase efficiency, right? But if you really spend the time understanding where this has come from, what are the objectives, you can then go and list as many options as possible. And I encourage you, make it create at least five, right? Just go crazy. We fully outsource, we fully build in-house, whatever possible, right? Write them all down. And then this thing, if there's one thing I want you to take away, is this lovely, hopefully not in like this lovely blue color, but this table. If you then go and you look at what are all of our objectives, what are all of our options, and you create a grid like this, and you hand this to everyone who's gonna have to make the decision, you say, right, let's go and score. One really is against the kind of like objective and five is super supportive. All do this. I mean, we kind of do this in planning poker, right? We go, it's like, well, how many story points do we think this means? And it gives you this dialogue to say, well, why do you say one and I say five? But if you do this across all of your objectives, across all of these options, it really gives you a holistic view of all the different options possible. There's some really crazy science. I mean, you can start introducing some weighting. I mean, my Excel spreadsheet at some point got really complex. I'm like, no, no, hold on, let's bring this back. But you then look at the total and it gives you a really great idea of how that looks like. Now, they also spend a lot of time drilling into the why. So I wanted to stay with that for a bit, right? Because you all maybe have Simon Simic about his talk about um, why, how, what, right? And it's a great explanation about the understanding of why do you do something and where do you have to start with. Now, I want to just quickly play this quick clip, um, because this is the importance from Patty, who is from SAS Rogue here. Now, I do apologize in advance. There is a bit of swearing within here. I hope it's all right. Um, but let's just go we, and play we're this. We're trained not to question orders. We're trained to carry them out. That's the number one. On morning number one, you must ask why. Why? Very fucking good. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You must ask why. Because if you know why you are carrying out your mission, when things fuck up, as they inevitably will, you will know how to achieve what you set out to achieve in a different way, in your own way. So why are we building two towers 30 feet high in the middle of the desert? All right, good luck because it's still on iPlayer, so you come back home and watch it if you want to. <laughs> um, so alongside that, I really encourage you to stay curious. Um, and it always surprises me how much inspiration I get from things around us. Um, so I love gardening, and I recently was potting along some seedlings, and my daughter came and was like, oh, Papa, I think I just spotted you in your happy place. And I do encourage you, find your happy place at work, outside of work, because at the end of the day, this should be fun, right? From gardening, I really looked, learned to look more holistically of what's needed to make a project or a team successful, right? This rose, I've planted, well, moved three times in the past seven years, and it's really only now because the earth, the light, the food, the water, the neighboring plants are all there to make it flourish to this extent, right? The conditions have to be right. Now, just like software, there are bugs, but I think in gardening we have beautiful bugs. So these are swallowtail butterflies. Um, 
slugs is a whole completely different matter. <laughs> right. But the other thing, I just want to mention is scouting. Any scouts in the, in the audience? Yes! Oggy, oggy, oggy! Right. Right, gee. Come on. <laughs> right. But um, I think what scouts really has shown me is the importance of values and principles, right? It's very strongly run by that. And it really is to look into every one of those values for the activities that you do. Right, and I, I mean, I'm a true believer. I might not change the world, although we may be with solid, but um, if we can get children to do that, I think it's, it's amazing. The other thing, however, it's also, it's talking about making it a better place, right? And the thing I bring to work is every role that I do, I want to leave the role in the better place for whoever kind of comes next. So I want to quickly share the values that I use when coming to work every day, right? For me, is that being authentic, have empathy, have a plan, which is where everybody goes, well, Hannes, that's not a value. But no, it's just an approach, right? Just always look where you're going and stay curious. So, oh, I'm getting a bit tight on time. Right. So I want to give you a bit of context about um, the BBC and why this is really quite important to us. So last year, we turned 100. And with that, just a super quick reflection on some of the technology innovations that we've done. So we brought you living, uh, radio in the 1920s. We brought you television in the 1930s. I only learned this recently, but that's actually one of the first, if not the first, website from a news outlet, which we brought to you in the 1990s. Then in 2007, we pioneered online video and audio streaming, and that brings us to today. And it's a really challenging world for a media organization, right? There are multiple different distribution mechanisms, your web, your mobile, your TV. There are the social tech platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it. So ensuring that all of your content is accessible on those is a massive endeavor, right? And we really need to look into how do we distribute and make this as efficient as possible. Now, the problem comes is if you actually run a rather large, kind of like what well, support a large user base, right? So we run a quite big news website. This just happened on the weekend, which is where all of your streaming all of a sudden goes 50% up to what it was the year before. So how do you maintain and actually keep all of this up to date and running? Now, we kind of really are looking into the next 100 years, and this is where, at the BBC, it wasn't created as a radio or television kind of like service, but it's a public service intervention into broadcast technology, uh, into communication technology, and I think that's ever more important. So let's look at that, and let's bring this back to kind of like us in the room. So what do we as architects or individual contributors kind of like, what can we do to actually realize an ambition like that? And I quite like to look at a circle of influence from control, the things you can do tomorrow when you come back to work, influence the things you have to work with others, and then there's the concerns where you literally, tough luck, you've got to go and work with them. So let's break this down. So this is our vision. We strive to be the world's first global digital public service media organization. So everything we do rolls up to that vision. Right? And I think it's, it's, it's an amazing one to work for. Now, there are a couple of changes that we've really done over these last two years. So we use something called the product flywheel to really look into how do we improve the organization. It's a bit challenging if you work for a public service organization where you don't have revenue as your kind of like output to check things against, but value. How do you measure value spent with the BBC? Now, where we as architects kind of like come in is that we can help to provide the data that kind of like fits and feeds every single one of these cycles. And it's really about how do I evolve it as an ongoing circle. The last few years, we moved into functional reporting lines. So this is really about best practices and principles within each discipline. Our teams are still cross-functional for every um, product that we work on. And again, this is where, from an engineering perspective, we have very much control about everything else, how other disciplines kind of work with it. You can um, just influence that. We reviewed our organizational structures. So this is where we went from very strong product verticals with some shared capabilities to horizontal cam shared capabilities, smaller kind of like product elements at the top. And this is really to optimize for reuse and consistency. So my team's kind of like bring the technical strategy within this. Now, it's not that simple, right? It's unfortunately this complex. And this is even a really, really high level kind of like architecture. But what this, and I'm, I'm down going to, the, I think the main thing is like all of these lovely little boxes that you can see right here, are all the kind of like audience experience, your web, your iPlay on, on web, you in mobile, etc. right? But what we've done, and I think some really careful consideration about our organizational structure, I really do believe Conway's law is a thing. We're able to very quickly go and see what changes, what's the impact for any kind of decision that we make across this kind of like whole estate. And that's really important. Look at your organizational structure. How does that map to your systems? Who do you need to go and bring into a room to actually make changes together? 
There's lots going on. Now let me talk about what we're dealing with here from an engineering kind of challenge perspective. Um, we have two large legacy systems that are running for 25 years that are about to be decommissioned. Um, we're really looking into what are the key technology decisions that we need to make to build this kind of like more unified stack. So how do we really optimize for cloud? How do you build a web and mobile stack that has a consistent reuse across the various different um, uh, kind of like platforms? How do you introduce a unified UX? And where and how do you introduce like common business logic? That then goes down to common capabilities. So how do we actually really make sure there's consistent metadata? How do we enable all of our engineering teams to build on the same practices and principles? And what are those key integration patterns across the whole estate? Now, and then finally, we really, one of the strategic efforts is to amplify our use of data across the organizations. So we're looking to evolve to a data mesh approach. So basically every single flavor that you can imagine in an engineering kind of like challenge. So what do we do? How do we approach this? There are many, many aspects, but I think I want to just highlight the ones that we've seen have made the biggest impact to us. And that's first off, the enablement to create communities, right? We really believe this when you, may that be a community of interest, practice, action, right? If you give people the time and space, they will do great work, right? And so we, we fully are behind this. There are about 24 and counting. I couldn't quite put them all on the side. And they go from, from everything, technical, not technical uh, related activities, but it really helps bring everybody together on a common interest. The other one is to really have a clear technical direction that is documented and that you pin others back to that organization knowledge point, right? For us, it's made out of four pillars. There are all these ones, um, and they each one provide principles, guidelines, guardrails across the whole, uh, or across those kind of like key themes. There are also some core principles or what we refer to as our non-negotiables, right? And that for us is resilience, reliability, and security. Our stuff just has to work. There's no question about it. And what I find, the more senior you get, right, and we talk a lot about top-down and kind of like agile and autonomy, I really think the more senior you get, it's all about figuring out what are the guardrails that I need to put in place so for everybody can kind of like still continue in a way that enables them to be autonomous and actually delivering that against that overall vision that I showed you before. Some more practical examples. So we're focusing on documenting our state in a common format. We use something that we call C4 modeling, which is basically like different maps of your whole estate. Um, and we're introducing REC statuses consistently across the estate as well. And this is really to aid our stakeholder communication as well as understanding of the whole, um, well, of everything. Now, just as an example, this is streamlined to um, do our information security reviews. So all of our threat models, for example, are done on these documents, which the team really like because it's the same documentation that they get from every single team. And the REC status is we drive directly from our common tooling across all our cloud accounts to really introduce that consistency from the core. And this is really quite technically, but we've introduced traceability across all of our various different components. And this is, I think, in particular in a world of microservices, serverless is something that we're pushing for quite hard. Understanding the traceabilities of how your different components communicate is critical, right? Because how do you otherwise evolve them? How do you otherwise replace them if you don't know exactly what the impact is of actually removing one of these lovely circles here? So let's review this back onto that circle of influence. From, from our perspective, an individual contributor is really there to do the technical direction strategy and introducing the best practices, right? These are the things we can do tomorrow. We can very much influence the organizational structures, right? We influence the processes and um, kind of like how do we actually translate the vision? But then there are the organizational things that will happen. Organizations do change, visions and missions do change, but then that kind of like gets handed down for you to, to execute on. Now, this slide was the one that I think the tech team really didn't like because I kept on changing it, right? I had like 12 different points of what are the core things I want to take you away. Um, so I just distilled them down to three. I think really do as few things as possible, but do them really, really well. As I mentioned, this whole notion of pass it on, like when you do a role, make sure whoever comes next, you leave it in a better place for them. I think that's absolutely critical. And then it's patience and presence over pace, right? I think we live in a hurry up world. Everything constantly changes, needs to be done ASAP. Find your presence, right? Be, do understand who you are within the whole environment and bring the patience. By patience, I mean really look at the assumptions, really look and questioning, like, hold on a minute, why are we doing, have we got all the data and all of it, right? It's not to slow it down. It's just to make sure you've got the information so you can succeed as best as possible. Time's up. So thank you.